not going to try and take questions. any questions. Uh, who's that? Uh, I don't know, but I think the guy think it's the Finnish guy. Yeah, it's it's true. Anti. Anti. Cool. That's our best guess. Uh, we're basically just going to play guess, lift our seat all day. Whole <laughs> <laughs> slides of this. Uh, so yeah, I'm just going to talk about nutrition for injury. Um, there's nothing too detailed that's going to override any of the stuff that uh, Paul and Jesse are going to talk about. So I'm going to try and keep it relatively short and then I'll put out some time for questions and answers if people have any more general stuff around nutrition. Um, the boring stuff, just for people, context who, who don't know, uh, performance nutritionist, worked with different uh, weight class based athletes including powerlifters, um, masters in nutritional science, so hopefully you can try and use some of that background to guide you through some more evidence-based practices that we know in nutrition may help you, number one, to prevent injury, and then number two, if you are injured, anything that might be worth considering. So in terms of injury recovery, there's a number of uh, questions we can ask ourselves around injury recovery. So I think one that most people can probably answer yes is, have you suffered an injury? Uh, did you have a recovery plan at the time? Or was it, okay, now I'm injured, I'm just gonna feel bad, not really worry about anything else, and when I'm better, then I'll start thinking about my training and nutrition, as opposed to actually having a proper plan in place. Did you alter your nutrition based on injury? A lot of people do this, but in, I think probably in the incorrect way. So we're gonna talk about the big mistakes people do when they change the nutrition after being injured, and maybe what you should do. Did they say you were done? Did they say you were done? <laughs> These are all things we ask once we get injured. So, just to give some context, obviously there's a whole host of different injuries that can happen within the body. And a number of those aren't really going to be our focus today. So we're of course just going to be, anything I say is going to be related to injuries of muscle, tendon, ligament and bone. Uh, the ones that we're most likely to get from training. Obviously there's a whole host of other injuries in the body that we're not going to touch on. Um, so, for example, some injuries that we're not going to address, injuries that result in extreme swelling of quadriceps. <laughs> uh, in medicine, this has been called lynch and edema, you may see in a medical textbook. Uh, so, there's nothing I can do for this condition, so... Uh, um, brain injuries. <laughs> you get results of in Again, in, in medical literature, you may see this as uh, Irish Wolverine syndrome. Uh, choking. <laughs> um, again, these are quite acute things that you have to address. Um, so be aware of these and other kind of injuries you can get are, are not really going to be our focus. We're going to be looking at muscle, tendon, uh, etc. Et so, in terms of the phases, there are two main sides we're going to look at um, pre injury and post injury. So the first one is kind of some basic stuff that's most likely to decrease your risk of getting injured. Uh, and you can also think of illness here as well, because that means less training time that you can put in. So injury and illness prevention uh, before something happens. And then after you do suffer injury, what you can do. And there's two really phases here. There's the acute phase, so once you get injured in that immediate aftermath. And then more of the, the rehab return to training uh, type phase, which is a bit longer and prolonged afterwards. So, in terms of injury uh, risk reduction, uh, one analogy that you may have heard before, uh, I know Mike Teixeira uses it quite a lot, is the uh, sink analogy for thinking about uh, uh, different stresses and how you can manage those. So, here's a, a graphic that uh, my friend Andy Morgan has put up that essentially <coughs> shows this same concept of if we think of a sink and what we're putting into that sink in terms of the water that's flowing in is different stresses that we can place on it. And obviously what drains out of the sink is the things we can do to account for that. So the main one being your work capacity to handle certain training. But we can also think of strategies that can improve our recovery from that work to be the same as increasing the drain size here. So sleep, nutrition, any other recovery modalities, we can improve how much you can actually drain from it. And this is important because if we have poor sleep and poor nutrition, and therefore only a small hole to drain water away, that means you can only tolerate a small amount of stress before the sink starts to over overflow. So you can only tolerate a small amount of training volume before something's gonna happen. If we do everything we can to increase how much water can drain out of this uh, basin, that means we can put 
more work in. So you can handle higher uh, workloads and higher volumes um, and higher stress to the body before you're likely to run into an issue. So where does nutrition fit into all of this? Um, it's mainly going to come down to recovery issues. So for example, we know with nutrition, some of the things we're going to talk about today is that uh, one thing nutrition is going to play a role in is after training, muscle regeneration, muscle repair and muscle building after a training session. We know that proper nutrition is going to play a role in glycogen synthesis, which just means storing more carbohydrate in your muscle after you use carbohydrates during exercise. Nutrition can be used to reduce fatigue. The most basic way to think about this is obviously the more food you're taking in, the more calories, the more energy, the less likely you are to be fatigued. If you starve yourself for a number of days, you're going to increase fatigue. And then we can do some sort of things to improve immune health. So again, if we have um, a higher level of immune health or our immune system isn't uh, suppressed, that means we're more robust to uh, keeping away from illness and injury as well. So by uh, addressing all these things, we can enhance our recovery. And enhanced recovery is going to reduce injury risk. If you are not recovering properly from the work you're doing, uh, you're obviously over time going to increase risk of injury. Uh, uh, Paul will probably talk about most of that stuff in terms of load. Before I talk about specific things for new, um, injury, just a very basic idea for nutrition that you kind of should be attending to most of the time. Uh, I'm sure everyone has kind of seen this, the nutritional pyramid put up by Eric Helms, which just gives a hierarchy of the things to attend to with your nutrition. Uh, this is kind of aimed at body composition, but the same goes for athletic performance. In terms of, as you can see, as with any pyramid, the base is the most important. And the most important thing to get right is energy balance, how much calories you're going to be consuming in relation to your expenditure. Um, on, on top of that, your macronutrients, so protein, carbohydrate, and fat intake. After that's taken care of, micronutrients, so vitamins and minerals. Above that, things like nutrient timing and supplements have some sort of effect, but a very small impact relative to the main things here at the bottom. So in other words, if we're talking about enhancing recovery and therefore improving our capacity to handle more stress, we need to make sure we're number one, eating enough, and number two, getting the right amount of macronutrients to support recovery um, and muscle repair. Other things then outside of nutrition that I'll just mention briefly is hydration. Uh, we're not going to go into really too much detail here, uh, but again, keeping hydration uh, is an important aspect for most athletes. Uh, for strength athletes, it's generally not as big a deal, just purely because sweat rate tends to be a lot lower than people in other sports. If you consider someone in boxing or MMA or track and field, for example, the sweat rates would probably be a lot higher than most strength athletes. Um, but in general, making sure you're well hydrated throughout the day is going to be important, number one, for overall health. That will tie into increasing your ability to recover from uh, training. And also, if you're dehydrated, that may actually impact uh, contraction in the muscle. So your ability to generate force in a dehydrated state um, is a problem. So let's talk about supporting recovery uh, for the injured athlete. There's going to be two main things we'll look at here. Uh, one, we'll look at the overall energy you're consuming and the macronutrients. And then we'll look at micronutrition and uh, some research on different supplements that may be worth considering. So when we talk about recovery strategies in terms of nutrition for injury, we're looking at different strategies that will aid in rust, uh, muscle repair and remodeling, um, immune function, and then mediating inflammation. This is typically what we're talking about with recovery. The big one to look at is calories and macronutrients. So overall, how much you're consuming and how much protein, carbohydrate, and fat the athlete is going to be taking in. Uh, as I mentioned right at the outset, this is probably one where a lot of injured athletes tend to go in the wrong direction. With. So for example, we know that when you're injured, in relation to your energy expenditure, on one hand, most people will be familiar that you're probably going to use less energy or your energy expenditure is going to go down, right? Number one, if you have an injury where maybe you've got, you're immobilized, you have a cast on your leg and you can't walk around, in general, you're going to be moving around less, using less energy. And especially if it's an injury that's preventing you from doing all the training volume you usually would. If you have a reduction in your training volume, you're using less energy. So your energy expenditure has gone down. This is true, but then the problem becomes then is first people say, okay, I have to account for this. I'm doing way less um, energy expenditure. So I'm just going to eat a lot less so I don't gain too much body fat. Also, the injured athlete will say, okay, if I can't put 
all my effort into training and getting better, I'll just use this phase as a, a way to die off some body fat. So when I come back and start training again, I'll be leaner and can eat more and, and start training better. So there's a couple of flaws with that, is that we know in a state of injury, you also have increases in energy expenditure in, in certain ways uh, as well. So if it's, say, a muscular injury and you have to repair and rebuild that muscle tissue, we know that's a very energetically expensive thing to do. So in other words, it takes a lot of extra energy to, number one, build new tissue, so when we're thinking about muscle hypertrophy, but also to repair damaged uh, muscle. You're actually going to use quite a lot of energy. We know that if we're trying to recover from an injury, we want something that creates what we call an anabolic environment, so an environment where we can rebuild some of this damaged tissue. So one of the things that's most anabolic is having a calorie surplus. So more calories coming in than we're actually using up. So if you're dieting, you're now in a state where you're hypocaloric or less calories coming in. So you might not have the resources to actually go and build that tissue at the rate you could, and it could actually prolong how long you stay injured. And we know that your resting metabolic rate, so how much calories you actually burn just by essentially existing, actually tends to increase uh, during injury, and this is due to something called a stress uh, factor. So this can be anywhere from 20% up to 50% increase in your resting metabolic rate simply from being in that mode of recovering from injury. And in fact, if you look at studies on Burns patients, this can go up to 100% uh, for the resting metabolic rate, so it's actually double uh, just because they're trying to recover from that. So for most normal injuries, you're likely to see, if it's very mild, it's probably going to be on the lower end of the scale, a more serious injury is probably closer to 50%. So now you've got an increase in your resting metabolic rate, so just how much energy you're actually expending to stay alive. So because of this, sure, we do have to account that you're going to be moving around less and training less, and therefore you're not going to be as active there, maybe not using the calories for training, but you also have increased need for uh, energy to recover from training itself. So if we're trying to speed up the process as much as possible, we need to make sure we're accounting for this and giving your body enough resources. So that number one being how much food you're taking in and overall calories coming in. So when it comes to how much I should eat, there's all different ways we can try and put those figures into different calculations to work up with a calorie intake. The most simple way is to track your body weight. And so we know that in general, over time, if you are at a state where your calories in is the same as your calories going out, you're going to be maintaining that body weight. If you're under eating, so less calories coming in, body weight will <coughs> over time gradually decrease. And on the flip side, if you're consuming more, your body weight will steadily increase. So the big takeaway I would say, and probably the number one thing you can do for recovering from an uh, injury, is to make sure that your body weight doesn't start dropping during that recovery process. So, when you are injured and you're trying to recover as fast as possible, then is not a good time to start trying to diet and trying to decrease body fat levels and eat in a hypocaloric diet. What you want to do is, at the very least, make sure your body weight is staying the same and you're maintaining uh, your current body weight by consuming enough calories. And even if there's a slight increase in body weight, and even if that means a slight increase in body fat as well, that's probably not going to be a problem and probably a good thing because you know you're at least consuming enough to put all them resources back into recovering from the injury. And once you're back and the injury is, is fully recovered from, you can easily die off that, that, that extra little bit of body fat that you need to put it on. But you've massively increased your chances of speeding up the recovery process by giving yourself enough calories to do so. The next thing is when we look at those macronutrients. And probably one of the main ones, particularly if we're looking at uh, muscle repair and, and remodeling, is protein intakes. So, very basically, and we, we could talk about this in a lot more detail, but at a very basic level, we have something called muscle protein balance, which is the trade-off between two processes. Uh, this green line indicates something called muscle protein synthesis, which means muscle building or muscle repair, and the red line is the opposite process of muscle protein breakdown. So, obviously during this time of trying to repair and remodel muscle, if that's the, the nature of the injury, and we want to try and promote positive muscle protein balance, which means we want more of this muscle protein synthesis as opposed to breakdown. So if we're already eating at a level of calories that is not uh, under eating, so we're maintaining our weight or above, that's a great start. What we can also do is pay attention to our protein intake as well and try and maximize this muscle protein synthetic response. 
So the number one thing to do there is eat enough protein, and you probably want to distribute that over uh, three to four high protein meals across the day as well. So that's um, uh, some of the, the basics, and we'll get to injury specifically in a minute. One other thing to be aware of is the quality of the protein source you're consuming, in that uh, one of the uh, amino acids, so one of the building blocks of protein that triggers off this MPS response that we're looking for is uh, leucine. So this is why animal-based proteins are probably going to be your best source to try and rely on uh, during this time. So uh, you can see here, whey protein and other dairy proteins tend to be the highest source of leucine. But really, if you're looking at any animal-based uh, source of protein, they tend to be best. So what you're looking for is just throughout the day, three or four of those meals have maybe 20 to 40 grams of protein in each of those meals, at least, coming from one of these, um, or one of the animal-based sources of protein is probably a good idea. In terms of uh, what that might actually look like, uh, again, these are different servings that would all surpass probably 25 grams of protein, and with that surpass the level of leucine we're looking at to, to maximize that anabolic response we're after. In terms of just general protein recommendations for strength trainees, it's a number of different studies that kind of shed some light on this. Um, in a non-injured athlete, so just trying to maximize your muscle building response and muscle repair response for someone who's doing resistance training, there's a recent uh, meta-analysis that showed that somewhere around 1.5 to 1.7 grams of protein for every kilogram of your body weight is probably going to be the maximum level where you're going to get uh, that muscle growth response. If they're getting those four meals of high protein across the day and they're getting as high as is realistic for that person, they're probably doing as much as possible. There's no need to force it. Um, but yeah, you're right, this kind of breaks down a really, really high level of, of body fat. Yeah, it kind of breaks down in terms of just like how practical it is to achieve that, I suppose, and how useful it is. Like... No, in, in terms of if we wanted the, the really the best accurate way to do it, would be to, to give a recommendation in terms of grams per uh, kilogram of fat free mass. But just most papers tend to give recommendations in terms of grams of uh, kilogram of total body weight, so we just don't have that there. Um, but like I say, if you wanted to, you could go with the, the Eric Helms recommendation, get their fat-free mass, and then multiply that by 3.1. That would probably be a good stuff point for something like that. Which not that situation, like, being injured, it's causing them to have more injury, and that's why they're going to be able to That's a question? Yeah, thanks. Okay, so in terms of overall calories and macronutrients, if you're looking for a start point, this is typically where I'd recommend if someone is injured. Number one, with your calories, like we said, put them at a level where your body weight is either maintaining where it is or even slightly increasing is probably going to be the best. Don't use it a, a, a recovery phase as a point to start dieting just because you can't do anything else. You're just going to probably take away from resources you could be putting towards recovering from that injury. Protein, uh, if possible, set it around 2.5 grams per kilogram of body weight. So again, take your body weight in kilos, multiply it by 2.5, that's how many grams of protein to aim for over the course of the day. Fat, there's no kind of hard rules here, but a good kind of starting point of one gram per kilogram of your body weight here as well. Um, so whatever your body weight in kilos, that's probably how many grams of fat per day to start with. Although, again, it's not exact, so you don't have to worry about specific numbers for uh, dietary fat. And then whatever calories you've left, just allow that to account for carbohydrate. Um, note that some people do prefer to reduce their carbohydrate intake when they're injured because they just feel, okay, I'm not moving around as much, so I'm going to reduce that a bit. Maybe I'll get more of my calories from protein and fat. If you want to do that, that's perfectly fine, but just note that... Um, when you're tracking your body weight, if you immediately drop your carbohydrate uh, level by quite a significant amount, you're probably going to lose some glycogen and water weight in the first few days. So your body weight on the scale will start going down in those first few days. Don't freak out too much about that if you've dropped your carbohydrate intake. Look for averages over the course of the week, and then you want that to stabilize out over time. So just be aware if you are doing that. Um, 
But really, once you're keeping your calories at a level that's not too excessive, there's no real need to go on a low carb diet just because you're not training. Um, some micronutrients and supplements that in research have been shown might be useful. Um, so there's not too much detail here because there's nothing here that you're going to take some supplement and suddenly going to cause you to recover. Um, there's things that in theory may be helpful. In general, most of the stuff around vitamins and minerals, it's going to be if someone is already deficient in those, getting them back up to a, a nutrient status that's not deficient is going to be useful. So I, I know there's quite a, a big trend in powerlifting at the moment for higher volume work um, and even higher frequency work as well. But more isn't always better, uh, when it, particularly when it comes to training volume. Um, there's going to be a maximum amount that you're going to get the best benefit from. And even if beyond that there's some that you can still recover from, it might not be all that beneficial. Sleep, rest and stress reduction um, are all going to again increase the amount you can drain from that sink to handle more of the stress that you're putting on it. Like I said, with some of the nutrients, the micronutrients, most of that is down to just making sure you don't have a deficiency. None of them by just like having super high doses of these is gonna do anything if you're injured, but making sure you're at least not deficient is gonna be the important thing. The best place to start is making sure that your food is generally uh, a variety of, of different foods, include fruit and vegetables, make sure you get plenty of nutrient dense foods in your diet to make sure you're squaring all, all those off. If you want to include a multivitamin just as an insurance policy, that's fine. And again, that might be something you would include. General supplements, um, we know for just general health and if you want to talk, go into the stuff around maybe mitigating inflammation, although I'm not too um, big on that. Looking at fish oil maybe, you know, probiotics, I said, can potentially tie into immune health, although it's still kind of an area where there's a lot more to work out. And I think vitamin D is probably a good one for most people to consume, purely because if you don't take a vitamin D supplement and you don't regularly get out in the sun, it's likely that your status is a bit lower, and then we know that can potentially affect other health. For some of the stuff you can do in the recovery phase, uh, a eucaloric or hypercaloric diet, in other words, a, a, a number of calories that you're maintaining your weight or even gaining weight slightly is going to be beneficial. Don't diet during the recovery phase. Uh, keep your protein high, higher than even normal, going up as far as two and a half grams per kilo. Uh, if you do have any uh, micronutrient deficiencies or suspected ones, supplementing to fix those is, might be useful. And then gelatin and vitamin C may be, again, there's only one or two new pieces of research and I wouldn't put too much stock in them, but potentially we might find in the future that they could help uh, with tendon injuries. Um, and again, like I said, in cases where your limb is immobilized, the big risk there is losing muscle mass um, and losing um, uh, muscle tissue. So creatine, leucine, and omega-3 are the ones that tend to get shown may have a benefit. So it, they're not going to do any harm, so they may be worth using during uh, that recovery phase as well.